Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another of the CEDA webinar series. Um, this is our second webinar on the use of Git and GitHub. Um, some of you will have caught up with our um, first webinar, and this takes us into some more advanced usage and extra features that we, we think is worth sharing with everyone. Um, I'm here with Poppy Townsend, who's our communications manager. I'm Ag Stevens, Head of Partnerships um, here at CEDA, and I'm here with Richard Smith, who's our software developer, who has um, done lots of the work to put this slide set together, this presentation. Um, just a quick word on housekeeping to start with. Um, so we have an hour slot, um, which will be about probably about 40, 45 minutes of presentation with time for questions at the end. Um, really important thing to say, if you are watching live, please send any questions you have um, directly to Poppy at the email address given here. Um, please do not use the question box on the webinar tool because unfortunately we cannot access that in real time. So if you're watching live and you have any questions, please email Poppy and you can see, you'll be able to see at the bottom of the slides a um, Poppy's email address. Um, so you can refer to that at any point. However, if you're watching a recording, um, then please use our standard CEDA support um, email address, support at cedar.ac.uk. Um, and also, please remember to fill in the feedback form when you finish, because we'd like to hear from you and get your feedback. OK, so we're going to cover two main topics today. We're going to be looking at advanced Git workflows. Um, so going into more detail about how you can work with um, Git as a tool at the command line primarily. And then we'll be talking more about GitHub um, as a, a web application and all the tools that that provides and the features that can help you do clever things with your, your code and your repositories. So I will hand over to Richard who's going to talk through advanced Git workflows. Okay, so uh, this is a summary of the things we're going to be looking at in the, the next section. Um, so we're going to be looking into branches, looking about stashing, merging and Git reset. And hopefully you should be able to answer some of these questions by the time we've gone through these sections. So with branches, you should know when to make a branch. You should know how, what to call your branch. Uh, importantly, you'd know how to make it. Uh, how to change between branches that you've made and delete them once you've finished and merged it. Stashing uh, is potentially a, a sort of a niche thing, but um, once you find a use case for it, it's really useful. So uh, we'll go through git stash and the useful commands surrounding it. Git merging is uh, integral to the branching workflow. So there are two major approaches. One is you can do it at the command line, and Ag will talk about how you can do it in GitHub as well. Uh, and some possible conflicts you might see. And then we'll talk about git reset um, in the context of unstaging from commits, undoing your last commit, and even destroying a last commit if you uh, decide you don't want it anymore. So start off with branching and merging. And this is just sort of an overview of the life cycle. So you would start your repository at a particular point, and you create a branch. In this case, we've called that branch called feature. Then your master is free to carry on uh, as it was before, and you can add more things to it, um, but it's independent now of your feature branch. So then you make commits to your code, you add new things in, uh, you, make, you create this feature which you've uh, specified, and then what you'll do is you'll merge that feature back into your master branch. So this is the, the general life cycle and an overview of branching and merging in Git. So the first question, when to make a branch? The answer is whenever you make a change, uh, something like adding a new feature or fixing a bug or if you just want to try something out. So remember Git is a, a version control system and allows you to test things with confidence. So you can make a branch, try something, and if you decide it's not going to work out, you can just destroy the branch and your code will be in the same state as before on the master. Uh, branches should re refer to small bits of work and they can contain many commits but should link similar tasks. An important thing is the master branch should always be working. So it's best practice not to commit untested code to your master. And we've got a little comedy image here. Um, you have to hide the pain if you commit to master and it breaks your code. So what do you call a branch? 
technically your branch could be called anything, um, but there's obviously good practice to follow. So it's good practice to make branches for specific issues and the clearer the branch name, the better. So here is a template. There are many um, different ideas around, but this seems to be one that is uh, fairly well agreed upon. So you would have issue slash, and then if you're using GitHub issues, your issue number, and then some short description. So for example, um, let's say in GitHub, you have an issue number three, which is called cannot open text file. Then your branch name might be issue slash three slash text file read error or something along those lines. Um, if you're not using GitHub issues, you can use something that makes sense. So um, you might use your feature name or a reference to a bug. And some examples, you might be doing a Python 3 refactor or creating a dashboard page or adding a NetCDF file handler. So you should use something that is clear to you when you go back to it after having come away from a while. So the, most, the more descriptive, the better. So now how do you make a branch? So there's one uh, command here, it's called uh, git checkout minus b. So this creates a branch and you move to it in one command. So git checkout minus b and then your branch name. So in this case, we're making a new branch called issue 34 timeout error. And it gives you a message to say, switch to new branch and the name of your branch. It is possible just to create a branch, but just stay where you are. So if you just call git branch and then your issue name, it will create you a new branch, but you won't have changed to it. So let's say you've got multiple branches, you want to change between them. The way to find out what branches you have is by using git branch. And in this case, you can see we've got two branches. We've got the master branch and the branch we just created. That little asterisk indicates the current branch that you're on. So in this case, we are on the branch issue 34 timeout error. If you want to change branches, then you use git checkout command. So you'd say git checkout and then your branch name and then that would change to the new branch. So if you wanted to change, in the top example, if you wanted to change the master, you would just type git checkout master, and it would say switch to new branch master. When you finish with a branch, so either you've merged it or you decided that the path you're going on, uh, you want to backtrack and you don't need that branch anymore, then you can use the minus D. So git branch minus D, and then your issue name, your, your branch name, sorry, will delete that branch. And it's useful to note that this only de deletes the branch on your local computer. Um, it is possible to do a command to delete the branch from GitHub at the same time, but you want to make sure no one else is using it. So I haven't put that here, but if you need to find that, then it's available online. So um, I said there were two approaches to merging, and we're going to discuss one of them here, we're going to discuss the Git side and Ag will talk about GitHub later. But I've just got a diagram here to describe the differences between the two. So at the command line, the way you would, your, your sort of, your flow, your life cycle would be you would create a branch, you'd make your changes, and then you'd merge those changes. And then if you want to, and, and if you're using a remote repository such as GitHub, then you would, you could push those changes up to GitHub. The other approach is in GitHub itself. So you create a branch, you make your changes on your local computer, and then you push those changes to GitHub. And then inside GitHub, Ag will talk about this later, but you would create a pull request, which will then merge those changes into the selected branch. So it's slightly different, um, but the general concept is the same. So just a quick recap to see where we've got to so far. So let's say we've got our feature branch we've created with using the command git checkout minus b feature. We then make some changes on it. And then this is where we've got to here. So we've got to this point, we've made some changes and we're ready to merge it back. So we're gonna show how to merge now. So this is how you merge at the command line. First off, you need to make sure you're on the branch that you wish to merge into. So for example, if you're merging into master, you want to make sure you're on the master branch. Then you would uh, type the command git merge followed by the branch name that you want to merge into your current branch. Um, so if you're merging into master, the, the branch issue 34, then you would type git merge issue 34 timeout error, 
and it will give you a little message saying uh, it's done a fast forward merge and it's updated the master branch to reflect the branch to reflect the changes. A couple of things to note: this happens again. This is on your local computer and doesn't require connection to the internet. Um, but that does mean that if you want to use a remote repository such as GitHub, you will need to push the changes after the merge. Something you might come across are merge conflicts. This happens when uh, Git isn't quite sure what change it, that you would like to have. So um, if you have two things with the same uh, same kind that look the same but have slightly different parts to them, then it might make a merge conflict. So here, this is what you'll see in your file if you try and merge. Uh, it adds these little um, arrows with a head and new string. So the stuff that's in your current branch, so if you're merging into master, this would be master. The thing that's on your master is contained within this uh, lots of left arrows with head. And then at the end of it, there's a load of equals lines. And that's saying that this section of code is what I see on the master branch. And underneath it, Underneath the equals, you have another section of code with uh, right-hand arrows, which then says your branch name. So this is saying that this is the code I have on the branch name. And basically, this whole section is saying, I'm not quite sure what you wanted to happen, so I'm asking you about it. And what you do is you choose which section you want to keep and delete the other one, uh, removing the arrows and uh, the equal signs, and then you would commit the result. And that would complete the merge. So git stash, uh, like I said, this might this is only something that I found recently, and I use it quite regularly now. It's very useful. Uh, so it, git stash allows you to save the current changes without committing, <clears throat> so you can reapply it later. This is useful if, for example, you need to change branch, or you've edited local files and need them to persist after a git pull. <clears throat> so for example, the, the, the thing that I may often use it for is if I'm um, editing a config file, and I don't want to put that um, and I want to pull changes down from, from the remote repository. So we have a little uh, thought experiment. So you start working on something. Another developer asks you to test a commit. Your code isn't yet working or it's unfinished, so you don't want to commit broken code. And you try and change branch, and then this is what happens. You see this message. So you try and change back to master, say git checkout master, and it says error your local changes to the following files will be overwritten by checkout. And it gives you a helpful message of what to do to fix this. It says, please commit your changes or stash them before you switch branches. So we've already decided that we don't want to commit because we haven't, um, it's not ready, it's not finished, it's not tested or working. So we can use git stash. And here are the main commands for git stash. So the first one, git stash, it just creates a save point. If you write git stash show, then it will show the changes inside your stash. So this is very similar to like a git diff, if you've seen that before. Um, git stash list will show all the available stashes. And if you want, so let's say you, you, you want to change back to a different branch. It says that you can't because you're going to overwrite something. Then you would type git stash and it would create a save point and you're free to change. And then when you come back, you want to bring your changes back. The command to use is git stash pop and that will apply the most recent stash and then delete it from your list. And then at the bottom there is also git stash apply. So if you had, if you use git list, git stash list, and you wanted to apply a different one, then you could use git stash apply to apply a specific one. So here's a little example. Um, we've called git stash. It tells us it saved the working directory and index state on our branch and uh, says what it saved at. And then you're free to change branch, pull from GitHub, do whatever you want. And when you come back, like I mentioned before, you can use git stash pop. And that will just take the changes in your stash and reapply it. And so then it gives you a message to show you what's changed. Now we're going to move on to git reset. So what does it do? It resets the current head to the specific state. Or in other words, go back to a previous commit. So I guess first question, what is the head? The head is the tip of your, um, your tree in GitHub. So you've got this branch, you've done some changes, and you're at the end of it, and that is called the head. So this is useful if you want to unstage a file before a commit or undo the last commit. 
So this is something you might have seen before. So you've, read, you've done git status and it says uh, changes to be committed, use git reset head to unstage. Um, so I've got the message down here. So this is the message telling you exactly what to do if you want to unstage that file. So how do we do that? We want to unstage our code file .py from our commit. What we do is we type git reset head and in the name of our file and then it will give us a nice helpful message, unstage changes after reset. Now if we do git status, we'll see that the um, file is no longer staged for our commit. So it's in some cases it will turn red for you. Um, and it would say that if you want to actually commit it, you have to add it first. Now, if you want to undo your last commit, so let's uh, say you've made a commit and you realize there was a mistake in it, you can use this command. You say git reset dash dash soft and then your git reference. And the way you get your git reference is a note at the bottom is you can use git log and that will show you all the, um, this is called a hash, it will show you all the hashes for your uh, recent commits. So here we say um, we've done our reset, our soft reset, and it's showing us that we've uh, undone the last commit and those files are ready to be committed again. So now what we can do is we can go into our code file.py and we can make the changes. And if we recommit, it will overwrite the one that we've we overwrite the previous commit. Sometimes you might want to destroy the last commit. Um, and I've put a big warning here, you will lose all changes, there is no undo. So you can't do this um, by mistake and think, oh, it's okay, I'll go back, because you can't. So be careful when using this, but sometimes it might be necessary. And in this case, you would use git reset dash dash hard, and then your uh, commit number. And uh, hard is what does the, the reset. And I put this picture here because it's akin to destroying a building. You can't, it can't come back. It's gone. Um, and sometimes that's good, so it's there if you need it. A uh, question is, what is the difference between a soft and a hard reset? So soft will move the head but leave your files unchanged. So we saw in the previous example um, that when we did the soft reset, it had the files ready to be committed, um, but they still had the changes in it. So we could go ahead and change things again and then recommit and overwrite. Um, but it didn't delete everything. Whereas if we do git reset hard, it would set it back to the last uh, state that you've specified. So if you say git reset hard and you put your commit number, then everything from that point onwards has been deleted and those changes are gone. So now we're going to move on to some more advanced features of GitHub. So that was the git section. And now we're going to talk about the GitHub platform itself. Okay, so Git, just to re <clears throat> recap, Git is the command line tool or, or a tool that you might have other clients for in your local system that you can use to manage your version control in your repositories. And GitHub is a website with a whole heap of tools that allow you to interact with Git repositories. Um, GitHub is very, very useful for collaborating. So we're going to talk a bit about that and we're going to talk about creating forks, creating pull requests, and how you can interact with other developers and other repositories using GitHub. Um, we'll also talk about a number of other features, including how we can view the change history and commits, um, creating tags and, and releases related to those. Um, we'll discuss how you can search repositories, look at GitHub settings, and then there are just a few other minor issues at the end, such as organizations, issues, projects, and wikis that are all handy things to know about. Um, Git, GitHub usage is essentially free, so it's a, a big ecosystem of tools that sit on top of Git and allow you to do some really, really cool things. So Richard talked us through how we go about creating branches and making changes on those branches and then merging them back in at the command line. So we're going to talk about something which um, does this in a different way um, using GitHub when you have multiple repositories in play. So this is known as forking and the use of pull requests. And this makes collaboration really easy between um, any number of developers. The key thing here is that someone can make a copy of your code and then suggest changes via a pull request, 
without making any changes at all to your own repository. So let's take a look at this. So here on the right hand side, we have the original, pro um, original project repository on GitHub and a user can make a fork into what's essentially then their own project, their own version of the repository, also on GitHub. They can generate their own um, modifications. So, so this person on the left may have seen something really useful in this original repository, but said, I want to extend this. I want to add a new feature to this code base. So they can add a new feature. They carry on working down their timeline. And then at some point in time, they refer back to the um, original repository by the way of this thing called a pull request. And then that pull request is going to feed back to the original author um, who may have also been doing development in the meantime. And then they can decide whether they'd like to merge that in to the original code. So here we are, we're looking at um, the GitHub web interface. And one of the key things about this is we have um, two people in play. So we, we're going to call this user Rich D, okay? And there's also another user, R Smith, okay? And these two people are going to collaborate. So this is Rich D's um, nice, simple repository. So we created a repository here called Fork Example. And um, anyone can look at this. It's a public repository. Um, up here, we can see a small picture of, of R. Smith. So R. Smith is logged in and looking at Rich D's fork example repository. And we can see over here in the corner, and um, there's some information about forks. There are currently no forks of this repository. So R. Smith, who's logged in, can say, I'd like to create a fork. So clicking on um, the fork button gives the option of creating a fork. This can take a, a few seconds. So GitHub normally gives you this image. Um, and we can now see over here that we've got R. Smith as the user, and it says that it's forked from Rich, Rich D's version of the repository. Okay, so once that's completed, what GitHub's essentially done is it's taken a copy of the entire repository, it's storing it under the user space of R. Smith now, so R. Smith has complete control of it. Um, but the nice thing is this all depends on Git tools. And Git knows how to diff between different, um, different repositories. And it knows how to apply merges and deal with conflicts and all those things. So R. Smith's now able to, to look at this repository and can decide to do some work. So in this case, um, the decision was I want to add a new feature via this um, new feature.py Python module, and that's the change that's been made. So just coming back to our, our image of where we were before, so at this point in time, over on the left-hand side, we have an entirely independent version of the repository where a new feature has been created. And one of the really nice things about GitHub is that it gives you loads of information about what's happening here. So here in red, we can see that it says... That, that this particular branch is one commit ahead, but also one commit behind the work that Rich D is doing. So the key thing here is that it's able to track the relationship with the base repository. Um, so there might be changes going on in the base repository. There might be change, changes going on in this fork, and GitHub will keep track of all that. So what we can do is, if... If R. Smith has now decided I want to submit this feature um, to be reviewed and potentially to be merged back into the original base repository, um, he can click new pull request here and GitHub immediately generates this page where it gives you the opportunity to create a pull request. And there's quite a lot going on here, um, but, but the nice thing is that um, GitHub makes it clear that there are two things being compared, and this arrow shows the direction of the potential merge that would happen. So in this case, we have um, R. Smith's repository and the master branch here, because we've not created any specific branches within this repository, so it's on master by default, and we're saying that Let's see what would happen if we merge that into 
Rich D's initial version of the repository, the base repository, also on the master branch. And GitHub does everything behind the scenes and compares these and says, OK, you are able to merge automatically without any conflicts. Um, it would give different messages if there were conflicts and you might have to go in and do something about those. But in this case, it's nice and straightforward. So we can just click on create pull request. And because Git's really good at storing the history of things and GitHub is the same, it gives you the opportunity to create a title for the pull request and um, fill in various bits of information about it so that you're giving as much information to the base repository as possible. In this case, we're just saying that this new feature was added to close a certain GitHub issue. And we'll talk about GitHub issues a little bit later on. So R. Smith can click create pull request. And there's a whole load of details that then get recorded. So we have information about what happened and when it happened. And you can see down here, it says this branch has no conflicts with the base branch. So essentially that's saying this pull request has been created, but there's a key thing here. It says only those with right access to the repository can merge pull requests. So R. Smith has now done everything he can do. He's put this proposal forward to say, I would like this work to be merged back into the base repository, but it's now up to Rich D if he wants to accept that pull request. So coming back to our workflow, we've gone all the way around and we've got to this point where this pull request has now been created and there's an opportunity to merge it back into the base. So this is, this is what the view might look like um, from the point of view of an author of the base repository. So Rich D or somebody else who has right access to the base repository will be notified that there's been a pull request. So typically that happens via email, but it can happen by other ways. And clicking on that link will take you through to a view of the pull request. And there's an option to click here, merge pull request. And there are various ways you can merge, but the simplest is just create a merge commit. So that will create a new commit in the repository that takes in that pull request of all the changes and merges them in. And in this case, it was going to happen automatically. So now the owner of the original repository, they can review the pull request. They can either accept or reject it. And it's a click of a button to merge that in. Some important advice in terms of pull requests and how big they should be and how complex they should be. If you keep your pull request small, um, potentially to address specific issues, um, then you're much more likely for them to be accepted. And really importantly, it's much less likely that there will be conflicts in the code. So the longer you have a divergence between the base and the fork, the more likely that there will be conflicts that you'll have to manually fix. So it's really good to get in the habit of using pull requests um, quite often in this way. Um, one thing to note that you might need to do um, on your local system when you're actually making the changes is that you might need to pull from the upstream remote repository or alternatively you can use git fetch um, pull and fetch um, we covered in our, our previous webinar and and this is a way of making sure that you pull in changes that have happened in the base repository if you need to and there's a, a, a useful link here with more information about um, synchronizing your fork and keeping it up to date with the upstream repository. So we looked there at using GitHub and using forking and pull requests. You can also use pull requests um, if you're just looking to do branching within a single repository. So this is um, much more akin to what Richard showed us earlier on at the command line, but instead of just manually merging at the command line, you can follow this type of approach where you create a new branch, you make your commits, and then when you're ready, you, you push those to GitHub, and then you use GitHub to create a pull request. Now, either approach is fine. You can do whatever's best for you, but one of the nice things about doing it on GitHub is that you can have a, a really clear documented history of what the pull request was, and potentially a discussion between the developers um, and a resolution of any issues or conflicts that come up before you get to the end here 
um, and there's a decision to merge back into the master branch. Um, so in terms of the way this might look on GitHub, um, we're, we'll imagine a situation here where R. Smith has, has um, got, got a copy of a repository. So this is called our non-forked example because we're not using forks. We've just got a single repository. Um, but locally on his own system, he has created a branch and made some changes in that branch. And you can use GitHub to look at all your branches here. So at the top, you've got your commit history, your branches, your releases, contributors. So if we look at branches, it tells us what the default branch is, which will always be master unless you change it. It lists um, other views of branches. So in this case, there's only one other branch. So it's listed in your branches and it's listed in active branches. So it tells you the name of the branch. And optionally, you can say, I want to create a pull request. So now this looks very similar to what we had before, um, only before it was more complex because we had two repositories in play. Um, in this case, we just have two branches for a single repository. And so here we're saying we would like to compare the issue one add code branch with master and the direction of this arrow suggests the way in which a merge would happen. So we're saying, can you merge that branch into master? And GitHub gives us a, a green tick here and says able to merge automatically. So that's great. It means there's no conflicts. We can do this again at the click of a button. Again, there's information that you can add about the, the pull request. So you can give it a title. You can give it more detailed information. And potentially you can tag other people to so other GitHub users and developers as reviewers. You can assign the specific pull request to an individual so they'll be notified when this gets created. Potentially you can flag it with labels if, if there's a useful label. So you might have you know, urgent or bug fix or high priority, whatever you wanted there. You can integrate these with GitHub projects and GitHub milestones. We'll talk a little bit more about projects later. So once you fill this um, pull request in, once again, you just click create pull request and that would go through and um, it would then be the, the job of the author or the assignee to look at that and decide whether to accept it. Okay, so let's just take a step back for a moment. So we've, we've covered branching at the command line. We've covered branching using GitHub and we've covered forking using GitHub. So it's worth us just comparing the difference between branching and forking um, on GitHub. So we just clear about the distinction between those. So if we're creating, if we're just branching, we are working within a single repository. So you, you've simply got one repository, you create a branch and you can either locally merge that or you can merge it via a pull request on github if you fork you're all, always creating an independent copy of someone else's repository and that becomes part of your own github account so you can manage your own changes and do what you like with that but it's completely independent but github knows that it's connected to the base repository in branching, you have total control over what you merge. Because you're inside your own repository, if you have right access to that, then you can make all the decisions about what to merge. When you're forking, you make suggestions to the original um, project, the original authors, um, about what you think should be merged. You create a pull request and you propose that. Um, but they don't have to merge it. It's completely their choice. And they might get involved in a discussion with you about um, some components of it they want to merge, but they might reject the whole thing. Um, when you're branching, pull requests are sent to your own repository. In the case of forking, pull requests automatically go back to the original repository. And when you're branching, you always intend to merge any successful branches back into master because master is the, the, main, um, the main branch of your code. That's what um, everything is tending towards. 
When you fork, um, GitHub projects can potentially be taken in completely different directions by a fork. So you may take a fork of someone else's code and know that what you want to do with it is something quite independent and that you don't have any intention for it to go back and contribute to the original project. Okay, so that's the difference between branching and forking. Let's go and look at some other aspects of, of GitHub that are really useful. So we can look at the change history by clicking on the commits tab um, for a given repository, and that will tell you how many commits there have been, and then it will display these chronologically. It will always tell you which, um, which branch you're on, so if you have multiple branches, you can select here, and it will give you a listing of all the commits, and really nice thing here is that you can decide to click on a given commit, and it will show you the code that was changed for that commit. And if there are multiple files changed, it will list each of these separately. And in this case, the code's shown in green because that's saying that new code was added. Was added. If code was replaced, that will be shown in red, so it gives you a really nice visual diff of what went on. And of course, you could get the URL for one of these and you could share it with someone else if you wanted to um, show them what's changed for a given commit. Another really useful feature of GitHub is um, what it allows you to do with code releases and tags. So you can tag a specific version of your code and generate what's called a release. So if we click on releases, we can get to this page where we, we're drafting a new release. Now there are various aspects of this that it's worth talking about. So first of all, the tag. Typically tags are given some kind of numeric identifier um, and a, a tag is a Git concept. So you can tag any given commit in Git, um, essentially giving it a label. So in this case, it's V1.0. Now what GitHub adds on top of the tagging concept is this idea of releases and I'll show you why that's, that's really useful. So when you create a release, GitHub lets you give the release whatever name you like. So we've got a tag v1.0 and we're calling the release itself initial release and we can write a set of release notes with it. We can then click <coughs> publish release and GitHub now gives us a, um, a web accessible page um, which you could then share with other people if you're sharing a given version of your code. We have the release title, we have information about the tag in there, we have the release notes and then really importantly GitHub gives us a way of packaging up all this code into a single zip file or a single gzip tar file. Um, so if you were thinking of publishing a release with a um, maybe alongside a scientific paper or something like that, you can potentially either point to this page or point to the, the zip file, for example, and that will, that will always be bound to a specific tag, which in turn is bound to a specific commit. So it's a point in your history that you said, at this point in time, this fixed set of code um, is this exact release. So that's a really nice feature of GitHub. Another thing you might want to do in GitHub is you might be interested in things, other projects that are out there that might be doing the kind of thing you want to do. So a while back I was working on um, compliance checking and I thought, well, let's see what, what exists on GitHub. So I searched for compliance checker and you can search the whole of GitHub in a, um, a single search and we got back 80 repositories um, matching the term compliance checker. So there are a whole lot of different things and GitHub will give you details about these, um, different things you could search. Um, but I was interested in repositories here and it tells me 30 of them are Python, eight of them are Perl, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a really good way when you're starting a new piece of work and you want to look out there and see, is there anything else that I might want to start with that I could learn from that I could potentially fork? So you can do that and then either, either fork them or, or get in touch with the authors to talk about them. Okay, there are various settings um, that might be useful to you in GitHub. So if you go to the top right corner of the page um, and click on the, the icon for your user, you can click on settings 
and this gives you a whole heap of things you can do. So um, some aspects of it are your profile, telling other people about you, um, and then there's a whole heap of things that you can modify, such as adding SSH keys so you don't need to use username and password, um, and associating yourself with GitHub organizations. So if we look at organizations, if you click down here, this would show you the organizations you're um, part of, and you can create new organizations. Um, in this case, this user is already associated with four organizations. You can leave those or click on those and find out other people that are associated with them. What's really nice about GitHub organizations is that they are free, and there are places where you can have a group of developers all um, associated in teams working on the same kind of things. So it's a really good way to manage your code in, in one place, manage a set of projects all together, a set of repositories all together. And if they're open source and publicly available, they're all free. Um, you can also manage access control policies by a team, so you can give a group of people within your organization access to certain repositories, and you have your own dashboard for each organization. Other useful settings per repository, if you're in a given repository, you can click the settings um, tab up here, and there's a, a whole load of things that you can, can do there. So in the options setting, you can do things like change the name of the repository. Um, you can enable and disable features. You can also, really importantly, change the status from public to private and vice versa. And there's the danger zone where, or in red, it tells you you can delete a repository. If you delete a repository, it will be permanently deleted. So make sure that you um, do that with care. You can um, set the collaborators on a repository so you can add new people with read, write access or admin access. You can make settings about the branches um, if you want to change the default behaviors. You can use webhooks to um, decide how the other um, services might be notified um, when changes get made. So for example, when a pull request gets made on a repository, you can um, integrate with other services and send notifications to other service to say that, that that's happened. You can set up email notifications to manage when you want to receive emails. Um, for example, when new issues are created or when there's activity in the um, repository. GitHub integrates with heaps of different applications. So you can get GitHub integrated with messaging systems such as Slack. Um, and this is a place where you can manage all the integrations. You can integrate it with things like um, continuous integration systems. So maybe when there's um, a new release created, it will automatically go and run a set of unit tests on a continuous integration system. And there are other features like deploy keys that are um, really useful to allow you to automate access to Git repositories. So just the last few things to mention, GitHub issues. This is a really good way of keeping track of bugs and features that you're interested in. So you can keep track of tasks that need doing and their progress. Uh, progress. So you go to the issues tab and click new issue. And this is a place where you can write information about things that need working on or ideas that you've got. Um, you can add content in there and you can add it in markup format so it's easily readable. And so here we've got an issue created and it renders this nicely. And then you can add more content to the issue over time as you, as you make changes or eventually fix things. You can add assignees, labels, projects, etc., as you could earlier on with a, a pull request. And then you can get a list of all the issues. So this one's just been created and you can order them and, and filter them in various ways. GitHub projects are an optional but a really useful way of having a view of all your issues and potentially just things called cards, which are just little notes that you want to associate. So this is a default view of a project and you have a set of columns and you can drag and drop issues between them. You can create new issues on the fly here. So it's a really good way of seeing the progress of of different aspects of the work that you're doing within a, um, within a given repository. 
And just the last thing to touch on, you can create a wiki for any repository that you like in GitHub. Um, so you click on wiki and that gives you advice about creating pages, um, using wiki markup to render those. Um, so essentially you can create um, detailed documentation associated with a given repository if you would like to. Okay, that's, that's everything from us. Thank you for listening. There's um, a few web pages there that provide useful extra information on Git and GitHub. Um, but I think now what we'll do is we'll go over and, and ask Poppy if we've had any questions, um, any feedback, and see if we can answer any of those questions for you now. Thank you. Okay, so I don't currently have any questions, but we will leave it open for the next sort of five, ten minutes. So if you've got any questions, email me now, and I'll keep refreshing my email. The link's at the bottom of the page in the orange box, the email address. Yeah, and if you've sent anything via the web form, remember that we can't see that in real time, so resend it to me now, please. I'm just going to pause on, on this particular diagram because I think that a lot, a lot goes on um, in this diagram and I think one of the take-home messages in terms of the use of GitHub and collaborating with other people um, is, is shown here. That, that this, is, this is about the way that you can find someone's um, repository on GitHub on the right-hand side and you can create a fork of it independently work on that for as long as you like and then using all tools within github you can then generate a pull request and you can uh, you, you then invite the author of the original project to decide whether they want to merge your code back in you don't need to ever meet this person you don't need to ever talk to them um, in real life but it's a really really powerful way that you can collaborate with anyone out there who is using github and git